Okay, I think um, just, just listening to the presentations this afternoon and looking through uh, the agenda from this morning um, and the workshop agenda from yesterday, you may have already seen almost everything I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but I guess what, what I'm going to do is just sort of look at it at a, at a holistic level. Um, and um, the, the idea is, as we're talking about uh, rolling out solutions, well, what are the right technologies to pick for, uh, for these solutions? And um, that's where I'm gonna go. So the problem statement here um, is that pretty much, uh, and certainly over the next few years, the only uh, IP addresses that you're going to be able to get, new public IP addresses, unless you wanna go down the road of, of uh, address brokering and all that, but that's, a, that's actually a whole different uh, um, subject. But uh, the only adre uh, public addresses that you're going to be able to get over the next few years uh, and currently can only get in some parts of the world right now are IPv6. Um, but at least for right now, the vast majority of content that's out there, the vast majority of destinations you're going to want to go to are still IPv4. So how do you roll out IPv6, uh, but still have those IPv6 users connect to IPv4? Uh, that's, that's, that's your challenge. Um, there are three uh, general classes of transition technologies, and I, I'm really trying to get away from that. Everybody kind of knows what you're talking about when you say transition technologies, but um, Deployment technologies or integration technologies might be a better word, um, unless you're looking at the broad picture of, of eventually trans, transitioning the entire internet from IPv4 to IPv6. But for now, we're just talking about how do we make these things coexist. Um, there's three ways. You can do dual stacking, which basically means everybody is talking both IPv4 and IPv6. You can use tunnels. Um, which means you can have two IPv6 uh, components talking over an IPv4 part of the network, some part of the network, uh, or later on maybe two IPv4 components talking over an IPv6 uh, portion of the network. Or you can do translators where you have an IPv6 only device talking to an IPv4 only device. Um, and they really don't know that they're not talking to um, a device of the same um, version that they are. So the IPv4 device thinks it's talking to another IPv4 device and vice versa. Um, and you've heard that terminology used over and over in, in uh, presentations here, but, but uh, that kind of a translator is called NAT64. In other words, six, uh, IPv6 to IPv4. Um, and you're familiar, certainly, uh, with NAT as we've used it traditionally for many, many years as NAT 4.4, where you're translating from uh, one IPv4 address to another IPv4 address, uh, generally from public, between public and private. And I'm going to look at these things sort of in the reverse of their complexity, um, starting with translators. And I won't go into a lot of depth here, um, simply because of, of time constraints, but uh, here we have um, an example of a translator, which is basically NAT64 with DNS64, uh, which replaces an older kind of translator called NATPT, uh, NAT with protocol translation, which generally had an integrated DNS application layer gateway, and there were some problems with that. IETF uh, deprecated that in favor of uh, this newer version, which defines the DNS entity separate from the NAT entity and solves some location problems and things like that that came up with older NAT PT. But basically, we had this, this uh, device over on the left uh, that I've just named V6 host, and there's some addresses in there as you can see. And over on the right is a device called V4 host, speaking on a V4 network. Uh, so there's an IPv6 only device, an IPv4 only device. 
Um, the first thing that happens is V6 host, when it wants to talk to V4 host, is going to query DNS, or just normal behavior. But that query is going to pass through DNS 6.4. DNS 6.4 then queries an authoritative uh, DNS server out there somewhere and gets back an A record. Um, what the DNS 6.4 does is translate that uh, A record, an IPv4 address, into a quad A record, an IPv6 address. Um, and it does a little, um, does it in a an, an, um, clever way so that the IPv4 address is actually embedded in the IPv6 address, uh, which you can kind of see over here. The address that's being returned by the DNS 6.4, the last 32 bits, is actually the IPv4 address out of that A record. Uh, so now, uh, V6 host has what it thinks is an IPv6 address, um, and it sends out a packet, um, which goes through NAT64. NAT64 looks at that and can use the embedded um, address in the destination address to completely pull off uh, the IPv6 header and replace it with an IPv4 header, um, and there's a, there's a process that it uses called SIT, S-I-I-T, uh, Stateless IP and ICMP Translation. Um, and I think Dimitri even mentioned that in, in his presentation a moment ago. But it adjusts all of the field values between IPv4 and IPv6, and it keeps a mapping of how that address is mapped from IPv6 to IPv4, and it sends out an IPv4 packet. When v4 host responds, it goes back through that stateful mapping. Uh, the tables are consulted, and again, we translate uh, the IPv4 header into an IPv6 header. You basically take off IPv4, put on IPv6, address, um, adjust all the values accordingly, and send the packet on. The result is that v6 host thinks it's talking to another v6 device. v4 host thinks it's talking to another IPv4 device. Um, that's a very elementary overview of how um, NAT64 and DNS64 works. There's some problems with that. Uh, you know, if, just looking at it at that level, um, it seems like that's, that's a great solution for getting uh, communication between IPv4 and IP, IPv6. Uh, but as you can see, there's quite a few problems there. Uh, one of them, and that was mentioned in an earlier presentation, is that traffic cannot be asymmetric. Um, because you've got that stateful mapping, any traffic that has been, um, any packet that has, has gone into this stateful mapping, the reply traffic has to go back through the same NAT device uh, to be able to consult that, that mapping. That makes that, uh, that NAT device um, a single point of failure, also makes it a pretty attractive attack target. Um, you know, you can do address pool uh, depletions and things like that on it. Um, a lot of applications will break uh, through these translators. Um, some of that is from years and years of poorly written um, applications that actually have hooks into the network addresses and other things, but uh, there are quite a few applications that will break. Um, there's no means to signal a session timeout. Uh, that could be a problem, particularly in some mobile networks. Um, fragmented packets don't translate correctly. Um, there's no translation procedures for SCTP, uh, which, again, could be some problems, uh, could be problematic for some VoIP networks, some mobile networks. Um, <clears throat> there is the possibility of dual quad A records. Um, you know, you, depending on what the network infrastructure looks like uh, when that V6 host uh, queries um, for, uh, uh, for a destination, it's possible that one uh, DNS server could respond with a legitimate quad A address. The uh, DNS 6.4 could respond with a translated address. Uh, and now, what do you choose? I've got two different addresses here. 
Um, so that's a possibility. There's also um, the, the fact that these translated Quad A addresses are not globally unique, uh, which could be a problem for some applications that make an assumption of globally unique addresses. Um, and then just like with, um, with NAT 4.4, uh, some IPsec modes don't work uh, through these translators. So the next, the, that's sort of a summary of, you know, this is complex, so there's, uh, there's some problems around it, it's not a perfect solution. Um, the next solution in that class of three are tunnels. Um, you can break tunnels down into two basic classes, either manual tunnels or automatic tunnels. Uh, and there's multiple solutions for each. A manual tunnel simply means, oh, well, and everybody understands a tunnel. I'm, I'm, I kind of always neglect to even define, you know, the idea of a tunnel being you're taking a uh, protocol packet and encapsulating it in um, behind the header of a different version. So, you know, an IPv6 packet encapsulated behind an IPv4 header or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So, um, with manual tunnels, you have to have, um, or for tunnels in general, you have to be able to define what those tunnel endpoints are. With manual tunnels, you simply configure the tunnel yourself. You tell the two devices that uh, are at each end of the tunnel what their addresses are going to be, uh, that they're going to encapsulate to. Um, so they're very good for permanent site-to-site -site connectivity. Uh, examples of tunnels uh, could be IPNIP, uh, IPNIP, or it could be a GRE tunnel as far as the actual encapsulation methodology. And I include uh, MPLS in this. A lot of people with big backbones are running MPLS in their backbone. Uh, you've already basically got a very good tunneling technology there. Um, and uh, particularly for, for service providers, MPLS becomes a very good way of getting IPv6 out to the edges of the network uh, quickly. And with an MPLS, uh, you could be using 6PE, which is just a native uh, encapsulation of IPv6 over an MPLS tunnel, or you could be using 6VPE, um, which is layer three VPNs that are IPv6 capable. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then you have automatic tunnels, uh, which are useful more for transient uh, connectivity. Uh, you want to set up a tunnel to a site to talk to for a while and then break down that tunnel at the end of uh, the conversation. Within automatic tunnels, every solution, you, uh, part of the, the auto, um, automatic tunnel is that there must be an automatic means uh, within that tunneling protocol to find out what the tunnel endpoints are going to be. Um, and every solution uses one of two techniques, either it encapsulates IPv4 tunnel endpoints in IPv6 addresses, or it consults an authoritative server. It says, I need to get to this address. Um, you know, what are my tunnel endpoints? And the server will, will tell it. Um, and we'll see an example of embedded, uh, actually we'll see a couple of examples of embedded addresses in tunnels, um, specifically, with, um, with six to four, uh, which is a fairly common automatic tunneling protocol, still you know, widely in use right now. Um, in this example, uh, we've got two IPv6 sites um, connected uh, over an IPv4 network, and we have these six to four routers uh, connected. Basically, it's just a router that understands six to four. Um, We've got an IPv4 interface on this side. I just made up these addresses, uh, 138.14.85.210. And out of that, we create a 6 to 4 prefix. Basically, 6 to 4 uses a reserved 16-bit prefix of 2002. And then the next 32 bits after that prefix is the hex version of that IPv4 uh, interface address. 
So here where we've got uh, 8A0E55D2, that is 138.14.85.210 in hex. Uh, on the other side, we've got the same thing. Here's another IPv4 address connecting into that IPv4 network. Um, and out of that, we create this 6 to 4 prefix uh, embedding that 32-bit address after our 16-bit uh, 6 to 4 prefix. Um, <clears throat> then to make this work, uh, we have a couple of devices here. And by the way, um, you know, the example I'm using here is showing using 6 to 4 routers to connect two sites. We could be running 6 to 4 all the way to an individual device. Uh, which a lot of people do, um, and, uh, but wanted to be sure to clarify that, um, uh, what I'm doing with this example here. So in this particular case, we've got host one out here on this IPv6 site and host two over on the other side. Um, and host one wants to talk to host two. It's gotten um, a six to four address for host two in this particular case, um, and then it sends a packet, uh, and you can see it's got a 6 to 4 source address and a 6 to 4 destination address. The 6 to 4 router recognizes that prefix in the beginning, and so it knows that the next 32 bits are going to be actual IPv4 tunnel endpoints address, endpoint addresses. Uh, so it looks at those 32 bits and pulls out the IPv4 uh, addresses for the tunnels, and then can, can set the tunnel up. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that's basically 6 to 4. There's a fundamental problem with 6 to 4, which is that 2002 prefix. You can't uh, route from outside the network without using a 6 to 4 uh, relay router, which basically does a translation. Um, because 2002 is reserved for 6 to 4 operations and is not globally unique, so you can't route directly to something like that. <clears throat> As a result, we have a newer protocol, which is actually a superset of 6 to 4 called 6RD. Uh, RD standing for rapid deployment, and it kind of implies what that's used for. You can very rapidly extend uh, IPv6 capability out to someone that needs it over a mostly IPv4 uh, network. So the first piece up here kind of just talks about what I uh, just said. Uh, you know, there's problems reaching a 6 to 4 host from outside the network. With 6RD, we're using the same procedures, but we're, what we're doing internally is taking a piece of our global IPv6 prefix and declaring that to be a 6 to 4 prefix. So from outside your network, uh, packets can be routed to a 6 to 4 destination, but because they're using a global prefix, they don't really know that they're talking to 6 to 4. Um, and you know, so from there, the operations are just the same. Um, so basically, he, the components are shown here. Uh, you've got a, a 6RD uh, border relay, and then, and I'm sort of doing the perspective here of a service provider. That tends to be what I mostly work with um, are service providers, and in this particular case, a broadband service provider. Um, but we've got at the customer location or the user location a 6RD capable CPE. Um, and you can also see. Uh, getting across this IPv4 segment of a service provider network to connect out to the IPv6 internet, uh, we've got IPv4 addresses for these two tunnel endpoints, and you can also see uh, the hexadecimal uh, version of those uh, dotted decimal IPv4 addresses. Um, and then basically everything encapsulates uh, through using those addresses. The operations look very much like 6 to 4, uh, except, like I said, you're using part of your own prefix that um, at the 6RD border relay, uh, that piece uh, or designated piece of your, of your prefix is understood to be 6RD, and, and so the correct encapsulations can be uh, performed there. 
Um, <clears throat> a few other automatic tunneling uh, devices or tunneling technologies uh, that I'm not talking about here just because of, of time. Isotap uh, is used mainly for doing local device to device um, encapsulations, also uses a, uh, an embedded IPv4 uh, technology. Tunnel brokers um, are, exam there's many tunnel broker solutions out there uh, that use uh, an authoritative server to assign tunnel endpoints. And then um, on, uh, Microsoft has a solution called Teredo. Uh, if, you're, if you're running a Windows machine with IPv6 capability, you almost certainly have Teredo capability on your machine. Um, and um, Teredo also uses an authoritative server to find out its, its tunnel endpoints. Um, the last um, of these transition technologies, the last class, is really the simplest class, which is dual stack. Uh, which simply means I put an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address on every interface. And now I can speak either protocol. So, you know, if, if uh, I consult DNS and I get a, an A record back, I'll talk IPv4. If I consult DNS and get a quad A record back, I'll talk IPv6. Uh, so really your entire transition is driven by DNS when you're using dual stacks. It's a very simple, very clean solution. The problem, the big problem uh, with dual stack is that how do you put an IPv4 address on every interface if we're running out of IPv4 addresses or if we are already out of IPv4 addresses? I mean, that's the whole reason we're here talking about IPv6. Uh, so that becomes problematic for, uh, for dual stack. The solution, um, particularly for broadband service providers, but it's also starting to be a solution that's looked at by large enterprises and the such, um, is large-scale NAT, or LSN. And um, I'll get through that kind of quickly here. But uh, large-scale NAT, I heard several people in presentations uh, use the term carrier-grade NAT, or CGN. Uh, both work, it's the same thing, um, basically, when uh, carrier grade NAT was defined, was first being discussed, uh, the assumption would be that these are in service provider networks and therefore it's on carrier grade, carrier grade equipment. The reality is there's nothing about this NAT that uh, is specifically required to be carrier grade and so people started uh, trying to use the term large scale NAT just to be a bit more accurate. The whole idea of this is that we take what we have of our public IPv4 addresses, and again, this is something of a service provider perspective, but we pull those away from the customer edge. You know, right now, most every one of us has NAT devices, uh, you know, CPE devices in your home. Uh, so you, maybe on the outside of that thing, you've got some kind of a, um, a public IPv4 address and you know you might be be uh, at the most uh, creating maybe a hundred, two hundred um, application streams out of your house, uh, which NAT is using upper layer uh, port numbers to map these different streams uh, to different um, to a single IP address. Uh, well, you've got over sixty five thousand. TCP ports, you've got over 65,000 UDP ports, so that's a very poor use, inefficient use of each IPv4 address that you've got available. What uh, LSN allows you to do as a service provider is take those addresses and pull them up to a centralized location to where now multiple users are sharing a single address, not just a single household, uh, but some large group of users, you know, maybe a whole neighborhood, is sharing a single IPv4 address, and as a result, you much more efficiently use what's left of your IPv4, public IPv4 address space. Um, there are three basic architectures around LSN. There's NAT444, 
there's NAT 464, and there's a thing called DS Lite, and all of those uh, I know have already been mentioned several times and probably described uh, several times, so I'll go quickly through them. But the first of these is NAT 44, <coughs> pardon me, NAT 444, uh, shown here, um, which is basically just two layers of NAT 44. Uh, you've got a NAT 44 at the customer edge, and then in your LSN, you've got another NAT 44. Uh, so it's a two layer uh, translation. Um, and what's nice about this is let's see, does this have a laser pointer on it? No, it doesn't. Um, what's nice about this is that between the service provider, um, yeah, the mouse doesn't show up any, either. Um, between the service provider and the customers, you can use uh, some private IPv4 address. Oh, thank you. In here. Um, so you can reuse this private IPv4 segment over and over. Uh, you know, each one of these could be a 192.168 segment for example. Um, <clears throat> one of the, another big advantage of NAT444 is that the customer NAT doesn't have to change at all. Whatever your customers have out there, whatever your users have out there right now as NAT44 will work in this kind of an architecture. It's only the addition of the LSNs uh, that is different. But there are some disadvantages. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, there are a lot of applications that will work through one layer of NAT that are going to break through multiple layers of NAT. Um, there uh, is a problem with filtering. Uh, if you are trying to communicate with an, another device behind the same LSN, uh, you're going to translate from some public address to another public address, and a firewall could be configured that will block that public address. Um, and so things don't work. So you've got to do either something like hairpinning through the NAT to actually translate all the way through uh, the LSN to a public address, or a solution that was proposed for a while that never really went anywhere is a thing called shared ISP addresses where the IETF or IANA actually would uh, take a small chunk of what was left of the public IPv4 space and reserve that for use in these kinds of situations. Um, like I said, that never really went anywhere. Um, another solution uh, that sort of goes beyond this uh, is not used very often, so I'm going to show it very quickly, plus I'm almost out of time here, is a thing called NAT 464, where in the middle we actually use IPv6 addresses. Um, disadvantages of this, well, an advantage first is that it gets us one, one step closer to where we eventually want to be anyway, which is just IPv6 out to the users. Um, disadvantage is, I already described the problems with NAT64. Now we've, we are doubling that. We've got NAT64 here, we've got NAT64 here, so we're actually uh, doing a two-layer NAT64. Um, so, problematic there. Not very many people are trying to deploy NAT 464, but it gets us also a little bit closer to a solution that people are looking at, which is dual stack light, uh, shown here, DS light. What DS light basically does is use just IPv6 uh, from the uh, service provider network out to the user. Uh, it has to have a DS light aware CPE. But that CPE, rather than doing any kind of translation, is just doing encapsulation. So it will encapsulate IPv4 traffic through this IPv6 only connection to get out to the LSN, uh, where it can then be mapped to a public IPv4 address. Uh, downside of that is the people that are looking at this right now, there's not a lot of DS Lite aware uh, CPE devices yet. 
There's a lot of manufacturers that are in the process of creating them, but they're not widely available. So that's a problem. Uh, then there's also simply the problem, you know, for service providers that, that you have to change out a customer CPE, um, you know, to get DS Lite to work. So there are some downsides, but uh, all in all, out of these solutions, uh, DS Lite does seem to be the nicest of them. And I am out of time here, so I'm just going to flip through these quickly. Just a couple of DS Lite scenarios here. Um, there's always some people saying, ah, oh, well, can I use large-scale NAT um, and just not have to worry about IPv6 at all? Um, there's a whole list here. Again, I'm not going to go through these because uh, that would probably take more time than I have left. But um, uh, there are quite a few uh, problems with any of these large-scale NAT solutions. They're not perfect. Um, things that break, there are security problems, there's monitoring challenges around these, and so they need to be looked at as just a stopgap measure to use your uh, remaining IPv4 addresses as best you can, rather than an alternative to IPv6. Um, so some conclusions on that, uh, like I just said, uh, that is, should be seen just as a temporary uh, solution rather than a permanent solution. Um, there's almost no production experience so far with large-scale NAT. That can be a bit of a concern, and so you want to be able to test carefully uh, what you're planning there. And out of all of these solutions, DS Lite seems to be the least uh, poor solution of all of them. Uh, somewhat intentionally worded that way, uh, the least undesirable solution. Uh, I will say um, in, in uh, closing here that um, I use this quite a bit to convince enterprises and content providers and such to make their content uh, IPv6 reachable make their public services IPv6 reachable, because if you do that, you circumvent all of the problems that a broadband service provider is, uh, is introducing by putting in an LSN solution to try to reach IPv4 content. So you just bypass all of that, um, and you don't have unhappy customers or unhappy users that are finding problems uh, with an LSN architecture. And with that, um, do I have time to ask for a question or so? Any questions? I kind of blasted through the last piece of that. Okay, well, thank you very much.